furious driving and today we've reached peak 80s we're back in 1984 and we're turning Japanese with this the Mark II Toyota Celica Supra now if you like reviews of interesting unusual different retro and modern cars then make sure you hit smash the like and subscribe buttons straight away do it now don't even wait to the end just do it now and now a quick word from our sponsor then on with the review Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and this is a 1984 A60 Toyota Mach 2 Supra. Well, technically, it's a Celica Supra, unless you live in Japan, in which case it's a Celica Double X. Because until I started researching this car, I never realized how closely tied the early generations of Supra were to the Celica, which it turns out it's actually based on. Well, I never did. Who knew? Well, you will in a minute. Watch on and find out. So the original Mark I Celica Supra came out in 1978 and it was Toyota's attempt to take battle to the rival Japanese muscle cars, the Datsun Z cars and the Mazda RX-7, those kind of things. And that car used basically a slightly lengthened and widened platform from a Celica, hence the name the Celica XX in Japan, not over here in the UK because we didn't get that car. It wasn't until 1981 that the Mark II was revealed and 1982 it actually went on sale that this, the Mark II, arrived on these shores where it's called the Celica Supra because basically it was like a Celica but more Supra. And Supra does of course mean better, kind of, it's a Latin word. Sort of. So astonishingly, and I had never really appreciated this until I started looking at photos just a couple of days ago, that from the B post back, this is basically a Celica, a Mark III Celica. If you look at the uh, little Hofmeister kink in the back of the window, isn't it interesting how other brands do BMW better than BMW do now? That's obviously very distinctive. Then you've got this wraparound clamshell tailgate and all this kind of stuff. It is totally Celica. I'd never really noticed that at all. So when you get forward at this point, you notice it's a bit longer and a bit pointy. You've got these flush fitting pop-up headlights, the ultimate 1980s accessory. Love that. And they've made it longer so they can fit in a more powerful straight six engine. So this car's got more of a creamy, powerful burble and a bit more oomph. So this is the big brother to the Celica. Now here under the bonnet is a significant part of what makes the Celica Supra such a special thing and certainly a bit more exciting than the equivalent Celica. This is a 2.8 litre fuel injected 5M GE straight six motor and what a thing it is. There are basically two engine options in the Celica Supra, the smaller two litre and this the 2.8. However, varying emissions restrictions around the world mean that different countries get different power outputs. The Americans were strangled down to 145 horsepower whereas here in the UK we got the best of everything with 178 horsepower and 287 newton meters of torque which means this creamy smooth delight of a lump is also an absolute sledgehammer of a power unit and so this thing will fly. Right let's take a look around the inside of the car now first of all we've got this big square metal door handle so high quality but so square and angular it is just pure 1980s in fact this entire car is lots and lots of angles. It's like a transformer from the original 1980 series or someone was told to go and draw the 1980s and they came up with this. Open the door and notice it is frameless glass. It almost looks like it should be a T-top in order to take advantage of this. But no, exotic 1980s-ness. Stepping inside we get that waft of that dry sweet smell that 1980s Japanese cars always have. And then we have very, very interesting door cards. Check out this stripy material down the center. It's actually quite heavily textured. It feels like the uh, grandparents sofa. It's amazing. That's surrounded by slightly soft, actually very soft touch vinyl. We've got the same soft touch here in this big door pull which feels nice and solid. We've got carpet down the bottom as well and even an elasticated carpet pocket for putting stuff in. Real high spec, high quality, high end things. Up at the top we've got a manual adjuster for your wing mirror and we've got our electric mirrors labelled right down, left down. I assume that does actually go up, not left or right when you push those buttons. Surprisingly plasticky door handle considering how solid and metal everything else is. And moving back we've even got a warning light so passers-by won't drive into your open door. And even a little hidden cubby hole area so you can hide stuff in your door down there as well. 
Now moving into the car itself, the seats are more of this astonishing stripy material, oh so 1980s. And check out these headrests. These do actually go up and down within these side frames, like giant Cybermen heads sitting up over here. Beautiful industrial design. The seat has even got adjustable bolsters so you can get yourself into your perfect clamped position for spirited driving. It's only a two door of course, so this flips it forward. Oh, these seats are nice and squishy at the edge, but very firm in the middle, so you know, good a range of support. Now moving forward into the car, it does feel low. It's very, very low indeed, sort of falling back into it almost. Now we have got a very poor T-shelf, I'm afraid to say. It's a large expanse of space here for the top of the dashboard, but it's a slope, so anything you put on there is going to fall off, unless you've got gummy bear sweets and you lick them and pop them individually on there to peel off later when you're driving, you're not going to be able to have your snacks on the dashboard at all. Any cup of tea will be straight in your lap. Very poor indeed. There's a small plateau of, of plate area just here, but all in all, it's about a three out of 10, maybe even a two out of 10 in terms of tea shelf free for the Celica Supra. Now moving down from that failure, we have got a great big flat face of a dashboard. It contains well, two central very square air vents here, a further one on the far left hand side and one on the far right. And that does integrate a glove box, which drops down quite nearly out of there. Oh, and hidden underneath the glove box, there is finally just a little tray for hiding odds and sods. And over on the passenger door, that window switch, rather than saying left and right down, it actually says up and down, so more traditional. And in the center, we have got our heating and ventilation controls. Now, this is quite interesting because this is all suddenly very smooth plastic. Whereas it's all very heavily textured, slightly soft just here, this suddenly becomes very smooth and quite hard with glossy clear with printing behind for the actual ventilation controls itself. We've got controls for the direction from face to, to screen. We've got temperature, low and high slider, recircle or not, even a left and right control. So you can choose where you orientate your air. Now moving over to the dial, I've really been putting this off as long as I can because this is an amazing event in itself. Because UK cars got the digital dashboard, which is absolutely fantastic. I mean, look at this thing. We've, we've got the digital taco, which goes into a rolling road style power graph almost, showing your peak at around 4,000 RPM. We've got our digital speedometer. We've got a digital fuel gauge. We've got a digital temperature gauge down the bottom in this bank of, of light up things. We've got our digital clock, then we've got our various ordinary warning lights for other things. Oh, it's quite fantastic. Now this is from the American L spec version cars. So this is really exciting. We'll try and get some shots of that on the move. Beneath that, we have got some little push buttons and turning dials to control things such as the clock. And left and right of that, like on a Mark I MR2, also from Toyota, we have got the controls for the rear wiper, the rear screen heater, that lights up actually. That's interesting. These big drums on the side of the binnacle on the right hand side, a similar kind of thing, but with uh, cruise control controls on a big drum. Moving back out, we've got our tiny little switch for hazard lights. It's a Toyota, you won't be needing that very often. And our drum style controls for wipers on the left hand side, so variable intermittent speed, which is mega posh for 1984, and indicators and lights on the right. You'll notice the uh, digital screen dims when you put the lights on. Finally, we've got our steering wheel. It's medium thickness rimmed. It's got a fake leather texture. It's even got fake stitching along the front. Kind of a hard plastic material and Celica Super in gold here in the center. And this is, of course, the horn. Horn test time. Wow, dramatically parpy. That's a Tokyo parp. We like the Tokyo parp. It does sit right down in, in your lap, but it is adjustable for height with this controller just here. Back to the center of the car, we've got a blanked off area, which could have been more audio equipment. We've got a single din radio, which is, oh man, this is perfect and possibly even came with the car. It looks so bright for it. We've got our massive ashtray, which incredibly has never been used. And over above it, we've got our 12 volt socket again, never been used to light a cigarette in the car, which is fantastic. And I'm seeing a button here, which says AC. Has this car actually got air conditioning in 1984? Wow, these things were high end. Moving back, we have the good gearbox, the five-speed manual. There was a four-speed auto available as well, but you're buying a Supra. Why would you want that? And coming back a little further, we've got our squishy, squeezy lumbar adjustment, which is a real 1980s thing. 
see also Ford Sierras. And moving back next to the handbrake, we've got our fog light switches front and rear, perhaps because in Japan those aren't mandated, so this is an afterthought for the uh, UK and European market. I don't know. And lastly, in the front, we've got a little cubby hole, just the right size for some cassettes to go in our tape player at the front. Now overhead, we have got an electric sunroof. So I won't be risking opening that, I never open sunroofs, but it does feel quite open and spacious in here. Now here in the back, we have precious little in the way of headroom because the lift back does start sloping quite soon on, so it's very much a space for kids. But we have got three seat belts, two three-point harnesses and a lap belt. And this amazing material just wraps all the way around absolutely everything. It's like a lovely hard wearing, but soft stuff. Got armrests built into the side. We've got nets for storage in the back of the seats. There's even a little ashtray here in the back. So if your kid's having a, a smoke on the way to school, they've got somewhere for their ash because these windows do not look like they open. I stand to be corrected, but I think those are fixed shut. Right, let's get the Supra, sorry, the Celica Supra out on the road. Wow. Listen to that exhaust note, that's so crisp and so, oh, better than a BMW, right. Now, I won't be able to do this once we hit the road, so while we're on, we've got a mile of farm track or so, so let's get a nice view of this incredible dashboard. Wow, that is so cool. Oh, the 80s was the best decade because ridiculous like, things like that. It was just fine to do. It flew. Shall we do a digital dash? Yes. Have we got technology? Not really. We should do it anyway. Yeah, why not? See also Aston Martin Lagonda. So this is my first ever drive of one of these cars. And I've got to say, I'm really surprised what it's like. It's nothing like how I expected with its low stance, fat tires, and all the rest of it, and the fat arches, I was expecting this thing to be a bit heavy and a bit of a handful, but really, it's quite the opposite. The steering is quite heavy. There is power assistance there, but it is heavier than you might anticipate. However, everything else is just so light, and the steering, I say, I'm calling it heavy, but that's just compared to climbing out of a you know, modern 20 teens car. This is pretty light by the decade standard. Honestly, this thing could not be more of a delight to drive. The gearbox is nice and light to flick through. It's a little notchy, but you kind of expect that from what is basically a muscle car. You'd be disappointed if it's too light and flappy. And you do sit low down, it makes it feel even quicker than it actually is. And despite that fairly high scuttle in front of you, you've got a great view out of the car. And the speedometer is really clear. It's gone into a 40 zone. I'm very well aware of how fast I'm actually going, which is really useful. Here in the UK, there was really only one spec and it was really well loaded. But in America, there were two. There was the type L and the type P. P for performance and L for luxury. So the P or performance version got a manual gearbox, a limited slip diff, different alloy wheels, the flared arches, different body kit, whereas the L or luxury one got the digital dashboard and the automatic gearbox. Here in the UK we got a mixture of both, we got the cool alloys, we got the flared arches, we got the digital dash, but we also got a manual gearbox as standard. But this was a, an expensive but competitively priced car. It was slightly more than a base Porsche 924, but that gave you so many toys. You got power windows, power locks, power sunroof, all the standard and lots of other toys as well. And in a car that was, you know, Toyota quality, screwed together in such a way that it's never going to fail. Now, like its predecessor, the Mark I, its chassis was tuned by Lotus, and that means it goes well. It's got independent suspension all round, McPherson struts at the front, and semi-trailing arms and a stabiliser bar at the rear. It's also got rack and pinion steering with variable weight on the power assistance, so everything you'd want and indeed expect in a car of this nature. If you need to stop in a hurry, it's got discs on all the wheels as well. It feels so well planted. The only problem with it really I've found so far is that you want to be driving faster all the time. It just feels like it's got so much more and the noise that engine makes when it comes on cam is just amazing. It's a double overhead cam engine and it just rips. 
and the Isu K-Spec cars have a 0 to 60 of 8.4 seconds and a top speed of 130, which was wild stuff in 1984. Pulling away and putting it into gear, the gearbox has got a lovely mechanical feel to it, like a chunk chunk, like a rifle bolt slotting into place. It really does feel good. Now, thanks in part to the very similar names of Celica and Celica Supra, or Celica XX, and also to do with, well, how similar they look, especially from the rear. There is a lot of confusion between the Mark I and II and first three generation Celicas and Celica Supras. However, from the third generation Supra, things changed. The Celica went front wheel drive, whereas the Supra stayed rear wheel drive, and the two cars diverged completely from that point. There were two more generations of Celica, the Mark III and IV, up to 2002, and then there was a what, 15 a year or so hiatus until the latest version, which is built in cooperation with BMW. The first three generations were built in Toyota's Tahara plant, and the fourth generation moved over to Toyota City. However, the fifth generation is screwed together in Graz in Austria. Now these things even had some race success. Win Percy claimed glory in one of these things in the British Super Saloon Championship. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this absolutely epic Celica Supra Mark II. It is just amazing, and I've loved every minute of driving, so thank you so much to the owner for letting me out in this car. It has been fantastic. I can never grow tired of that exhaust note. It is just absolutely epic. So thank you for watching, and join me again next time driving something completely different. Mm-hmm.